Great, nice to see so many introductions coming in. I believe we are now live on YouTube. Unless the techie team in Jakarta tells me otherwise. I'm ready to begin and can I get a thumbs up from the ASEAN IPA Secretariat Office, Ambassador Reslin, can you hear me and see me? Yes, and in, in the Philippines, King, can you hear and see me? Great, and Min So U, you can hear me and see me? Good, we may have some technological breakthroughs. I'm also getting messages from people who are watching on YouTube. So I think we're underway. So keep the introductions coming. Good afternoon, good morning to some of you from all over ASEAN, but I actually have seen people in the room today that have come from other parts of the world also. My name is Emma Leslie. I'm the Executive Director of the Centre for Peace and Conflict Studies and very happy to be facilitating this afternoon's learning session, discussion, webinar, opportunity for us all to pause and have a think, not about COVID this afternoon, but most especially about peace processes and how we work together. The official title for today, of course, is Conflict Resolution and Peace Building in Southeast Asia. And something that I've long argued in this region is that we have a wealth of experience around our region um, from the experiences of Aceh and Timor-Leste, facilitation experiences in Malaysia, um, Myanmar, Philippines, we're going to hear more about this afternoon. And of course, we have with us um, the Executive Director of IPA, Ambassador Reslin also. The format for today is that we're going to hear from both of our speakers. I'm going to introduce them to you in a moment. But then after that, uh, we will have a discussion, Ambassador Reslin, respond to them, and then some time for all of you to have questions and answers. Um, I think we've set ourselves the technological challenge of doing this through two platforms. So we'll see actually our peace building facilitation skills in bringing together YouTube and Zoom into the one conversation. Um, I believe, and I may be wrong about this, but I believe in Timor-Leste there's a tradition of apologizing before you make a mistake. So I'm going to apologize on behalf of our, our CPCS and IPA teams this afternoon as we test out this technology and try to work together across the region. I also want to acknowledge that this afternoon, we have asked our speakers to give a particular flavor or focus on the role of government and CSOs in their joint efforts for peace processes. And so I think you'll hear from their presentations that's something that comes through. But I think you'll also know from both of these speakers that this is something that they have embodied in themselves. Um, the journey of civil society and government. Um, and I think probably a little revolutionary spirit from both of them also um, in the struggle for making change and bringing about real and sustainable peace to our region. As I said, I'm Emma, I'm from the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies, originally from Australia, actually, as you can see by my face, uh, but recently uh, became a citizen of Cambodia I am a very proud grandma, but also very proud to have lived um, in Cambodia for this past 25 years. And our center is based out of Siem Reap and Battambong in Northern Cambodia. We are partnering with the ASEAN Institute for Peace and Reconciliation, one of our favorite peace building partners in this region who bring together not only government, but a range of stakeholders across the region to continue to try and learn. And I think that's the point of this afternoon's process. So without further ado, you all came into this space and please continue to keep introducing yourselves on the chat. We will give you a chance later to ask your questions there. Uh, I want to begin by introducing both speakers and then I'll hand over to them and then uh, later to introduce Ambassador Reslan. I think uh, Ter Teresita Quintos Delas requires absolutely no introduction in our region, but I'm going to give you a little insight into what she's up to now and why, of course, she's very significant for this afternoon's conversation. She is currently the chair of the International Centre on Innovation, Transformation, Excellence and Go Excellent Governance which is in short called Insight Gov. And I think you may want to Google that and look more about the kinds of work that they do. 
um, incredible um, object objectives there, innovation, transformation and excellence in governance and something I think that we can all learn and aspire from. But Ging, as we affectionately know her, is also a member of the ASEAN Women's Peace Register, which of course is the initiative to promote more women into mediation across our region and to utilize the many resources that we have. And of course, Ging has been a champion of the register. She's also the chair convener of Every Woman, which is a Philippine based movement. And again, something to Google and look deeper into, especially for those Filipinos amongst us today. But probably the thing that she's most known for in our circles of peace and peace processes is for her two terms as presidential advisor on the peace process to the Philippine government, 2003 to 2005, when she cut her teeth at it, but then 2010 to 2016, where she oversaw the signing of the negotiation and signing of the comprehensive agreement on the Bangsamoro, which we know was a significant transformation of the conflict in the Southern Philippines. Maybe a less known fact about Ging is that she also oversaw the first national action plan for women, peace and security in our region coming out of the Philippines and has actually set a standard for many of us in how we think about those issues today. So we're very much looking forward to hearing from Ging. Just like me, she's also a rocking grandma and so um, also making sure that she plants the seeds of peace into the next generation also. Dr. Min So U from Myanmar uh, is currently the founder and executive director of the Myanmar Institute for Peace and Security. In fact, uh, Dr. Min So U is an expert, I would say, perhaps, or has studied significantly at George Mason University in conflict analysis and conflict resolution. And so I think he brings that analytical academic perspective into his practice. Um, he has or was the executive director of the technical secretariat on the joint ceasefire monitoring committee. I don't know if you can hear, but there's a big storm brewing up here in Phnom Penh today. Uh, the joint ceasefire monitoring committee in Myanmar from 2016 to 2017. But his peace process experience in Myanmar in particular started in 2012 as the director of the ceasefire negotiations under the Myanmar Peace Center, which many of you will remember was the beginning of this last rounds of Myanmar peace process. I think also important to know about Dr. Min So U is that he was very active in Washington in the Free Burma Coalition from 1998 to 2005. I'm not sure all of you were born by then, but even before that, he was part of the revolutionary movement, the All Burma Students Democratic Front, which struggled against at the time the military government in Myanmar. So what you can see from both of our speakers today is that they have both moved backwards and forwards from civil society to government, government to civil society. And in that way, they provide a very unique opportunity for us this afternoon to reflect on the importance of both roles as we think about the particular case studies we have that we can draw on. So without further ado, if you're skilled at Zoom, please join me in welcoming uh, Ging Dallas, if I may ma'am call you Ging on this occasion, um, by clapping your hands in whatever possible, it may not be possible on this technology, but shaking our hands, clapping our hands and welcome you Ging over to you. All right, um, good afternoon to everyone. And first of all, uh, to th say thank you to Hyper and to uh, CPCS for inviting me to speak this afternoon. It's certainly very important. I think that as we struggle through these very uncertain times that we make sure that the work for peace continues. So um, as was said, I will be sharing um, uh, some thoughts, experiences on what is referred to in, in the invitation as a complementary efforts between government and non-state government actors. Um, I, I have a PowerPoint, so I hope that's being set up now by the Secretariat. Uh, and I am drawing uh, my presentation from experience, as, as has been said, uh, long. I, I counted yesterday, it's 33 years of work in the peace process initially as civil society. And but as was mentioned, I did um, a sum of um, nine years as um, 
as a uh, cabinet secretary or um, minister uh, for the peace process in the Philippines. So as was mentioned by uh, Leslie, on this question that we are talking about, on this topic that we are talking about, I do have experience from both sides of it, both as government and as civil society. So I, I let me start now. Uh, the next slide, please. I, next slide. I just want to start my presentation by uh, just doing a very quick um, uh, going back to the birth of the Philippine peace movement because um, this establishes, I think very importantly, the position that civil society has taken in the Philippines in its work in the peace process. Uh, the first um, peace organization uh, that started in the Philippines was the Coalition for Peace very early in 1987 when the peace talks uh, with the communists that was declared by President Cory Aquino right after our people power uprising. Um, was not going well, and as it did happen, it broke down within six months. And the civil society or non-state actors were beginning to get together and, and saying that um, this cannot be, we want the peace, give peace a chance. And so uh, the Coalition for Peace was born, uh, mainly looking at um, the insight that peace talks cannot be left to the competence alone. Um, too many years to... Too, too much pain in fighting each other um, makes the peace table difficult. So they have to be accompanied. And it was a claim of the unarmed citizens, those who had also fought the dictatorship, but without arms, to say that we have a right to be in the peace process. We have a right to have our say because um, both parties say that they speak for us. So in fact, we are um, a third party. In fact, you could even say the first party because if both sides are speaking for us, then let us really uh, be heard. So um, that was the start of the peace process and it's pretty very much the inspiration of what has been happening through the years of uh, civil society or NGO or non-governmental actors uh, pushing the peace process. Can we have the next slide, please? Yes, yeah, so um, civil society in the Philippines has played many roles in, in the peace process, but I pick four, four major roles uh, that uh, demonstrate uh, the need for the coming together of government and uh, the non-governmental actors. So these uh, four examples are real intersections between government and uh, non-governmental actors uh, that were important in pushing um, the, the peace process in the Philippines. And there are four, as I said, first is building a peace agenda. What does one talk about on the table? And the experiences there will be coming from the National Peace Conference that I, I will speak about and the National Unification Commission, which was a platform for civil society, but a platform that was opened by government very deliberately. There, are, there is um, the civil society acting or coming in as third party in the peace talks. And there is the experience of the multi-sectoral peace advocates as I will speak about a little later. There is a ceasefire monitoring and accompaniment. The ceasefires are very important. That also needs some accompaniment by non-state actors. And finally, the legislative lobby when uh, the peace process or the peace agreement um, says that a law has to be passed then uh, civil society has come in to push uh, peaceless legislation. What I'm going to try to do now is just do some very quick snapshot, snapshots uh, for each of this to give an example of what exactly did that mean. And I have to apologize that because I am working from home uh, because of the pandemic, uh, I've had to rely on pictures that came were easily available uh, to me. So the, this is quite limited. This is not the best, but in a way it it, it helps to focus the stories I will be telling. And uh, I know we don't have much time, so let me quickly go over it. So the next slide, please. So the, the, the first, as I said, the first role was to build a peace agenda. And uh, we have here two pictures. The main example here is the National Peace Conference, which um, uh, was formed uh, by, by many who were also very involved in the Coalition for Peace. And the question was not just on how is the process of talking, but what do they talk about? Why is it that government is talking to the armed parties? 
Uh, but we, what about our peace? We also need to have our say. We also need to have our agenda put on the table. And the coalition and the National Peace Conference has happened. Went through a nine month process of birthing that first agenda. Uh, about 14 sectors starting from the ground, meet many meetings, coming to consensus, uh, bringing the consensus of the sectors, and then meeting in one big national peace conference that brought a consensus across 14 sectors. This became the basic sector's agenda, which was picked up by President uh, Ramos, and uh, which he adopted as the social reform agenda, which to this day continues to be a major pillar of the Philippine peace process in accordance with the executive order set um, that has been signed by, by, the, by uh, successive uh, presidents. And um, so that basic, uh, basic peace agenda, social reform agenda, in fact became the basis of the law, the National Anti-Poverty Commission, which means that in government, there is a platform and mechanism by which basic sector leaders basic sectors through their leaders are able to directly engage government about social reforms that are needed by the country to have real peace. And uh, these pictures just show, on the right you will see um, that this was the 10th anniversary of the National Peace Conference and the uh, 10th anniversary and we had two former presidents, President Cory Aquino and President Fidel Ramos come and grace that because they, um, they had valued uh, precisely what, what this effort was about. On the left, is a picture from the from the early National Anti-Poverty Commission. These are basic sectors. You can see that there's a young boy there because children were part of the basic sectors that were working on a peace agenda. But there are two who are in brown that we were in the national peace agenda. We are wearing vests, but I'm, we're now we're now at this time in government. I was lead convener of NAPSI, and uh, my companion was secretary for uh, social welfare and development. So that's a process that has continued of basic sectors, people not in the peace, uh, not, not, as a form, uh, not as former combatants or not as combatants coming and putting their agenda on the table. So that's the first one, building a peace agenda. Uh, the second one is, uh, next slide please. The, the second one is of NGOs or, or civil society being a third party, uh, being part of that official process, what is called track one. Uh, helping to influence the process, helping to find when uh, when there are problems, when there are issues that the two sides are not able to agree on, sometimes helping to find uh, common, um, common ground uh, by which the two sides can come together. And always, always being there to say, don't give up, stay on it. The first two pictures on top uh, are really not, are not from the Bangsamoro peace process. These, these are from the uh, peace talks between government and the communist forces that that is still an ongoing problem in the country and for this process after um, after the peace talks had broken down in the first 100 days of uh, President Cory Aquino civil society was uh, pushing for the peace talks to be returned and they formed the multi-sectoral peace advocates which did shuttle diplomacy between government and the armed uh, and the communist um, underground forces, bringing their uh, ideas, bringing bringing what their thoughts were on proposals that were being brought brought out um, across the two sides. So we were meeting with government very formally, but the government knew that we were also talking with the underground, uh, and that was okay. That was okay because we were bringing back messages of how to make the peace process, uh, um, the peace talks, uh, happen. Uh, the, in the in the Bangsamoro peace process with the cab, you did not have such a structured um, such a structured uh, process mechanism uh, for civil society to be on the table. But you will see here in the lower um, level of pictures are um, civil society actors being there in Kuala Lumpur during the talks and being invited to observe and also to advise. In the middle picture, in fact. You have a civil society uh, personality that is sitting while with the two parties on, on either side, in a way, a sort of informal mediation. And the final picture on the right just shows um, the depth, the diversity of the sectors, uh, the constituencies that came together uh, to put their ideas um, before government. 
the next one is the um, ceasefire. Uh, next, next slide, yeah. The ceasefire accompaniment. Uh, I, the, the pictures here are a moment in the start of what we would call Bantai ceasefire. Bantai means uh, to guard the ceasefire, uh, where we had a civil society group who made that their, their task. They accompanied um, the ceasefire mechanism of both the government and the MILF. They would be there. Uh, they would, um, when, when, uh, when there would be tension and the ceasefire mechanisms of both sides would come, civil society would be there. And in fact, um, a big, uh, uh, was a big factor in gaining trust between the military forces, the combatants on both sides and civil society. This picture I said is the beginning of that where after a big um, outbreak of violence in 2003, uh, civil society groups brought the buckwheat uh, evacuees who had been displaced by that together and they brought them out in the streets and uh, just to call for a ceasefire, a return of the ceasefire. And um, I was then already um, part of government and I was sent by the president to come and talk and talk to them. And after that, when the ceasefire was restored, the NGOs continued the work and this work of accompaniment of the ceasefire up to this day. And as we know, um, <clears throat> the, the ceasefire continues to hold and the numbers of, um, of encounters really went down. The fourth, um, the fourth area is lobbying for um, peace legislation. In the, in the case of the Bangsamoro peace process, the comprehensive agreement on the Bangsamoro said that a law would have to be passed to create um, to create the new Bangsamoro government, the enhanced autonomy. So the civil society lobbied, and you can see on the left, um, they're being in Congress, uh, watching the proceedings on the plenary floor. On the right, uh, you will see that they are holding fans because that was one of their um, promo promotional materials. I am a BBL fan. I am a Bangsamoro basic law fan, which they were giving out even at, um, at bus stations uh, during summer. So you, you, you indicate your support for the peace process. So, th so those are four areas um, uh, that, that in the Philippines had shown, um, shown progress, a good interaction between government and, and non-government that really pushed it. Just some more pictures of, of, of civil society coming to make their, their, their sentiments felt, coming to make their agenda felt. And I just pinpoint that picture right right hand uh, corner with President Aquino, former President Aquino. This was within the last two weeks before he stepped down from office after completing his term, uh, when the peace panel, the government peace panel published a book and the civil society came and were invited. And you will see there, the different ethnicities, the multi-faiths that had come for this process. And this was in a way President Aquino's recognition. And, um, and uh, thank you uh, for civil society's participation here. So we go to the, um, uh, I will speak also about one, one effort. Uh, the next slide, please. This is the public advocacy that was promoted by government at, at that time. I am for peace campaign, which tried to get people from all sectors um, to make it really a national issue to, so that even people who were far away from Mindanao would begin to feel it, would be, feel that they were part of it. And one of that, this picture here shows the launch of the I Am For Peace campaign where we had uh, celebrities, uh, movie, pop stars, in fact, musicians, um, football stars coming together to say, to vow, uh, to pledge to be an ambassador for peace, um, taking their oath of office, uh, taking their oath to their oath to be part of this peace process. So to, uh, to use their uh, celebrity status in order to bring to the minds of the public that there was this very important process coming on. Uh, the next slide, please. Just some of the things that, have, that were done under the I Am For Peace campaign. So as I said, we launched National Ambassadors for Peace and had peace champions. We invited business uh, partners. So there was a restaurant uh, that in fact started to serve uh, food, um, dishes that were inspired by, uh, by, by Southern Philippine cuisine. Um, 
uh, a logistic uh, company helping to bring bring supplies around that would be useful for the peace process. Uh, we had every September the annual peace month where there would be a football camp for children, peace concerts, a fashion show for peace uh, with uh, with one of our fashion designers doing a whole fashion show with um, inspired again inspired by the fashion from southern Philippines. Um, mural painting on the wall of military camps, photo contests, postcards for peace. We held um, youth camps and there would be video and social media contests. So this, so that by the time when the comprehensive agreement on the Bangsamoro was signed, it was pretty much um, something that uh, Filipinos rejoiced about, even people who were very far away from the conflict areas. So just some thoughts on what worked and what helped. Uh, I, I put this as some of the things that immediately come to mind. I think in this uh, interaction between government and non-government actors, it's important that there's mutual respect and understanding of each other's context. And basically, we're talking about the context of the state being a state with its obligations. NGOs cannot come in and, and demand of government that they do away with that. If there are um, processes um, for, for doing a budget that had to be gone into. If there were already laws, other laws also already in place, that had to be, that had to be respected. If uh, state, the state procedures uh, needed to be followed by the state. At the same time, uh, the NGOs to continue to be respected as an independent domestic third party, which is really asking government, don't try to co-opt them. It is their independence that brings, that gives value to them. Once they are looked at as just being partial to government, then the other side stops listening to them. They have to be there to tell both sides off if we're going wrong or to be able to offer proposals. Um, allies from the other side, to recognize that there are allies from the other side, that always in peace processes, there, there is no, no one is homo completely homogeneous on the other side. So you look for your champions there. And in a way, the, the crossovers, the, what was mentioned as people who move from civil society to government and back. Uh, are able to play that role and sometimes get caught, get caught in a way when former colleagues expect them to do more and they are not able to because they are now part of government, but in a way it helps to keep the understanding and the dialogue going. There has to be a structure and reasonable protocols because government cannot talk to everyone. So civil society had to organize, had to have their um, mandates clear. Are you government wanted to make sure when we talk to somebody that tomorrow another NGO will come and say, but we don't agree with that. There had to be these processes. Transparency and accountability. People had to tell each other just how far this will go. It isn't just talking and then it never gets anywhere. And women's participation and leadership, always, always very important because women are the one who stay with the peace process, who don't get tired of it. It's not seasonal for them. They do both policy work and housekeeping. Uh, they're able to talk to women wherever side they're coming from. So they're very important in this work, which um, I'm down now to my last three. Um, the next slide, please. Uh, just the platform of the National Action Plan on Women was a very good intersection for government and the civil society. We will have to say that the National Action Plan in the Philippines was in fact initiated and pushed by civil society and was always making sure that government was not just having a document that would be put on file and never looked at, that it was implemented. And the next, next slide. Next, yes, just to say again, because this is so important. No, before that, please just go back to the women. Yes, that women matter and that women make a difference. The ones on the right are just the women that, that played key, key roles in the, in the peace process. It was a very women-led uh, uh, peace uh, negotiations um, leading to the comprehensive agreement on the Bank tomorrow. And finally, just my last slide. The next slide, please. I wanted to end with that because as times get more difficult as the as the new situation, the talking is so important, face-to-face, -face, trust building, that is so important uh, in the peace process. How does one do this now in, under the new situation? We are going to have to navigate new grounds and we, we are going to have to navigate periods when 
uh, government and also NGOs become very preoccupied with other concerns. How do we make sure that we stay on track, that, that conflicts that are remaining there still continue to be worked on and, and brought to transformation? And I end with this picture because for me, the children, the next generation, we cannot forget. They are waiting. They are waiting and conflict, the conflicts that we've had to live through it is so important that we are able to leave to our children who are so hopeful with all of those candles that they laid out, that our children will live in a better place, in a fairer, more peaceful, uh, a world where they each child can, each child, each person can be the person that he or she deserves to be. Thank you. Thank you so much, King. And if you're just joining in, you've missed an amazing presentation on civil society but and and philippine government peace processes but i also want to acknowledge in the room ambassador seges who's joined us um who's obviously been a part of some of those peace processes that ging has referred to without further ado if you've just joined us please introduce yourself on the chat please make sure you're introducing yourself to panelists and attendees but without further ado, we're going to just go straight to Dr. Min so U, who is the Executive Director of the Myanmar Institute for Peace and Security. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is Min so U from Myanmar Institute for Peace and Security. Can you all hear me? Yes. Good. Uh, so I, I'm not using a PowerPoint. Uh, uh, but instead, uh, I'll be uh, talking through uh, this presentation. I have a presentation right in front of me. So before we talk about the peace building and the interaction between and coordination between the government and the civil society, let me briefly touch upon some background in Myanmar context of the civil society. So since 1962, Myanmar was under uh, authoritarian regimes up to 2011. So it's a, it was a 50 years of authoritarian rule uh, that shrink the civil society uh, political spheres. So usually at the time, the civil society was reduced into non-political sphere, uh, mostly in religious and in humanitarian areas. Uh, at that time, access to international funding was quite limited to non-existence. Uh, the politically active civil society at the time went underground and the opposition groups mostly based along the border areas and neighboring countries uh, became the uh, uh, different type of civil society groups. So international assistance flew into Myanmar across, as a cross-border clandestine money to engage in anti-government activities inside the country. So mostly those uh, activist-based and politically active underground movements uh, are concentrated among the civil society organization around that time. So basically the civil society in Myanmar was very much in contradiction with the existence of the form of the government in Myanmar up to uh, 2011. However, after 2005, some civil society space gradually uh, opened up, uh, especially in the roles of the humanitarian programs uh, after Myanmar was hit by Nargis hurricane uh, in, in uh, 2007 as well. So uh, let me talk about the growth of civil society in Myanmar. So the, that growth of the civil society in Myanmar started in 2011. There was a transition in 2011 for two uh, main reasons. One reason was the government lifted uh, regulation and restrictions on the civil society, uh, especially when it came to uh, uh, registration. So civil society in Myanmar uh, can become an entity even without registering it. So according to some statistic, around 2014, the number of civil society exploded to over 10,000 local CSOs. Uh, only about 3,500 uh, had actually registered uh, to the government system. 
So that opening of the political space also coincide with the growth of uh, civil society. Another reason also the uh, international funding assistance. The international funding assistance to those CSO came to Myanmar after 2011 with almost no restriction from the government until very recently. But up to this point, we can say that international funding in Myanmar is quite liberal, uh, controlled by the government. Even if you look at the United States, United States have much more stringent uh, control of the foreign fundings to their CSOs in the United States. So that was the, uh, the growth of the civil society in Myanmar. Uh, so let me talk about how the civil society play a role in the peace process. As I explained previously, the civil society in Myanmar uh, historically uh, be involved more like anti-government organizations and humanitarian organizations. And when it comes to political spheres, civil society were pretty much suppressed under the authoritarian regime. So automatically the civil society became anti-government in nature uh, in the political spheres. So when this political sphere opened up uh, by the transition in government after 2011, a new civil society also usually they do not trust uh, the government in power. So in the peace process, uh, there are a number of activities, a number of the type of civil societies emerge and evolve. So I have eight categories that civil society usually involve in the peace building process. One of the advocacies. So in advocacy, uh, what type of work the civil societies usually engage in the peace process by advocating what they think uh, should be the right cause in the peace process. So this is a one, uh, uh, probably the most uh, frequent type of activities civil society engage in the peace building process. The second type, what we observe uh, is a capacity building. Uh, implemented by the civil societies in the peace building and peace process. So capacity building usually divided into the two types as well. So one type is a grassroots based capacity building. So the civil society organization groups provide knowledge related to the peace process, peace building, peacemaking to uh, people in the communities, the people in different uh, ethnic groups, so mostly grassroots oriented capacity building. The another type of capacity building we observe is the stakeholder capacity building. So this is a civil society with more, much more the uh, technical capabilities. They provide capacity to those stakeholders who are directly, who directly involved in negotiation in the peace process. So the third type of the civil society involved in the ceasefire monitoring. So the ceasefire monitoring, a civil society became the part of the uh, crucial elements uh, to be involved uh, in the, uh, the ceasefire monitoring. But on the other hand, that also create uh, uh, some challenges. So I'm, I'm going to talk about challenges after this slide. So the fourth uh, part is a public consultation. So the peace process require a lot of talk down vertical and horizontal uh, dialogue. So the civil society play a critical role in promoting public consultation and bringing public voice to those people who are sitting at the, uh, at the tables for the negotiations. The fifth type is the civil society play a role in the track to uh, dialogue on different type of the subjects. And seven, uh, the sixth type is the research uh, and technical support. So research and technical support, some of the civil society, civil societies, especially think tanks, uh, they do have the capabilities to uh, conduct very systemic research and provide that knowledge and share this knowledge to uh, those people uh, who are sitting at the table for negotiation, as well as the general public who are interested about or who should 
be informed about uh, the specific type of subjects on the peace process. And the seventh type of, is the stakeholder facilitation. So civil society, uh, some of them have the capabilities to facilitate uh, particular type of dialogues in the track two or even track one or track 1.5. So these are the uh, seven different types of the civil society involvement in the peace process. So I'm going to talk about in the next two slides, I'm going to talk about some of the best practice and what can work and what cannot work uh, to promote uh, coordination between the government and the civil society in the peace building. The civil society in Myanmar, in many other countries, by nature, they are more like an activist oriented. So they could be outspoken. Uh, they may tend to criticize. Uh, they may tend to advocate for whatever they believe in. But in the peace building, that uh, orientation doesn't necessarily fit into the need of the nature of the work uh, the civil society do. So in general, for example, in Myanmar, uh, the bureaucracy of the government historically were very anti-civil society. On the other hand, the civil society was also very anti-government as well. So even after 2011, when NLD, the uh, former opposition of the pro-democracy movement became the government, the NLD government's bureaucracy was still uh, in, uh, intentionally, uh, there's a residual effect of the anti-civil society in the bureaucracies. So that is a institutional memory. It doesn't go away uh, easily or in a short time. So that needs a lot of confidence building between the civil society and the government. So for the government to work effectively with the civil society, the governments must have a concrete strategy in working with the civil society in the peace process. So in this strategy, the rules of the game, the rules and norms must be clearly defined in a fair term, acceptable by both sides. So that is very critical for the government. A lot of governments engage the civil society without having any specific strategy. The fallout of not having a strategy is your bureaucracy will organically react to the civil society. That is pretty much like anti-civil society. So the government must have a concrete strategy and have a clear instruction to the bureau, uh, bureaucratic divisions, so the bureaucratic apparatus of the government, how to deal with and interact with the civil society in a more constructive manner. So that's a one way. And another uh, is the promoting civil society participation to strengthen peace building. Uh, that is critical. So it's, which is better than shutting doors for the CSOs. Uh, so the government has a tendency to shut the CSO uh, away from the peace process. But in our experience, the government reach its goal more effectively if they allow the civil society to participate in a more constructive manner in the peace building process. And the thought is the government must interact regularly with the CSOs. So they have, they, the government needs to dedicate some focal person to interact with the CSO regularly, regular meetings, regular dialogue with the CSO and briefing CSO representative about the progress, the government policies, uh, Etc. And also another critical point is government should not expect the CSO to be in line with their policies. Uh, so usually the government usually expect the CSO. Okay, well if we engage with the CSO, uh, they may uh, become uh, pro-government. But that usually not the case. Uh, that should not be the point for engaging the uh, CSOs. So government should expect the CSOs to criticize. The government should welcome the criticism uh, from the CSO as well. Uh, another point about uh, the, how the government should interact with the CSO is 
when the government implement the peace building initiative nationwide, the government should be able to coordinate with the CSO in implementations. So these implementations should not be the standalone by the government. Instead, the government incorporate the CSO to be a part of the implementations. Another critical point is the government should be able to utilize expertise from the CSOs. <clears throat> Usually, uh, the CSOs have a lot of expertise in thematic areas. So government should be ready to utilize uh, the expertise as well. <coughs> uh, so my next presentation is about the best practice what the CSO should engage or should consider while engaging with the government. One of the critical concepts the CSO should take into account is the fact that government is a stakeholder. Government is not the enemy. So this is a critical uh, principle CSO should keep in mind when engaging with the government in the peace process. Uh, number two is the civil society can be fashionalized. So in Myanmar, uh, we do see the explosion of civil society, the growth of the civil society. At the same time, we also see the fashionalized civil societies, and this fashionalism is growing as well, uh, based on ethnicities, especially on the religions. So the, when the civil society is fashionalized, uh, that create more polarization in the peace process. So they become more anti-peace building rather than peace building in the peace process. Uh, the third point about the civil society is when civil society do engage or implement, they should engage all stakeholders in the peace process. The peace process is by nature, it's a multiple stakeholder. So if the civil society engage their own activities uh, with their own mind uh, at some point, uh, they will receive or they will experience uh, some obstacles imposed by those stakeholders. So consultation is very critical for the civil society, especially uh, in activities that require uh, some engagement uh, from the uh, government. So another point is the transparency. Civil society should be able to transparent, especially when it comes to funding. So governments are very uh, cynical, or they tend to, they also have their own conspiracy theories in the government. So when you're dealing with the government people in the government, the more transparent you are, the easier for you to build rapport and, and, and trust with people in the government. So make sure you are very open about your fundings, uh, how you engage uh, with different entities uh, to the government. Another point is civil society must have the technical capabilities. This is how you gain respect from the government. So if a civil society group doesn't have proper technical capability, the government may not consider you as a viable uh, partner. So the government, the civil society and technical capability is very critical to attract stakeholders for coordination. Uh, another critical point is civil society engaging in the peace process must be impartial and ethical. Uh, if the civil society is very fashionalized and partial, uh, they may find it difficult to be working with the government as well. <laughs> yeah, so if I just give you two more minutes, yeah. So uh, I'm going to make a last point. When it comes to peace building, the civil society, uh, one of the challenges of civil society is sometimes the civil society can be funder driven. 
when there's a fund of civil society engage activities, even without consulting the uh, stakeholders. So that was a case in Myanmar when it came to civilian ceasefire monitoring. So the ce civilian ceasefire monitors went out and <clears throat> did their own initiative without consulting with the government, without consulting with the EAOs, without consulting with the military. So the result was they did not have cooperation from these groups. So when these ceasefire monitors collect monitoring information, government did not use them. Government also did not receive them. Military did not use them. Military did not receive them. And <clears throat> EAOs did not use, EAO also did not receive them. So the civil society with very good intention and capabilities, their efforts can become fruitless if they don't have proper buy-in from the stakeholders. So in contrast, for example, like in the Philippines, the CCCH uh, did a very good job uh, with the civil society because the civil society and those government and armed groups already got the buy-in uh, at the early stage. So independent monitoring of the civil society worked in civil society uh, in Philippines. In contrast, in Myanmar, uh, it did not. So it is very critical that early buy-in from the stakeholder is very critical for the success of civil society in the peace building process. So let me end my presentation here. Thank you so much, Dr. Minsoo. And I see people still coming in, but I also see in particular from Myanmar, uh, Dr. Ujo Mien from Myanmar ISIS and uh, Dr. Sansan A, who is also part of the ASEAN Women Peace Register and the Director General of the Department of Social Welfare. So thank you. And I also saw a very large Myanmar civil society contingent show up today. So I'm sure they have lots of questions and comments for you. Um, without further ado, and to keep the time that we promised and honored to keep with you all, um, I want to introduce you to Ambassador Reslin, who is the executive director of the ASEAN Institute for Peace and Reconciliation. He's just doing his hair. I can see as getting ready. Um, of course, he has been the ambassador to France, um, to UNESCO for Indonesia, but also um, the director general of the multilateral affairs of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. His peace building roles, though, in life were, of course, to be the ambassador to the United Nations, where we know a lot of peace building, peacekeeping oh, resolution happens. Let me mute you, Ambassador Reslan, until I finished introducing you. He was the head of the Indonesian delegation um, of senior, to the senior officials meeting between Indonesia and Timor-Leste um, on the Commission of Truth and Friendship, which we know was an important mechanism and process for the Indonesia-Timor-Leste relations. Um, and he was the chair of the committee of the OIC on the Southern Philippines and helped to mediate Philippine government and the Moro National Liberation Front. But today we have him in his last months as the executive director of the ASEAN Institute for Peace and Reconciliation, as a Cambodian NGO focused on regional peace processes. We have appreciated so much um, the partnership that we have been having with him, um, not him in particular, but with IPA and then and between CPCS and IPA under his leadership. So handing over to you to make some comments to be the discussant, sir, of what we have heard. Yes, thank, thank you. Um, distinguished participant of this uh, webinar, uh, dear panelists, friends, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me first of all thank everyone for uh, participating with enthusiasm in the second part of the ASEAN IPR webinar series. And I would also like to extend my sincere appreciation to you, Emma, and your team from the Center of Peace and Conflict Studies for partnering with us, the ASEAN Institute for Peace and Reconciliation on this initiative and for doing such a nice job in moderating this session, especially uh, uh, by introducing me with, uh, with such a flowery manner. Uh, I would like to extend my warmest regard to, and high appreciation to our distinguished uh, speakers, uh, Mr. Rita Quintadeles and Mr. 
Min Zau for uh, agreeing to share their experience in conflict resolution and peace building. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as we are entering the fifth year of the implementation of the ASEAN Political Security Blueprint 2025, it is interesting to look uh, at how ASEAN is realizing its endeavor to be a people-centered and people-oriented community. And in this regard, I would like to zone into some action lines in the APSC Blueprint 2025 that calls for collaboration with civil society and or academic institution. Uh, in the early years of its existence, ASEAN has been criticized as an elitist forum where foreign ministers and high level government officials meet and make commitments and decisions by themselves, but would in turn affect the people of the region. Hence, the wider, vo the wider voice of the people of ASEAN uh, represented by civil society was not seen as enough being taken on board in the dynamics of of ASEAN at that time. Is far, too, is far too important to be left to the government and government officials. And of course, as, as such, there is a need for ever expanding involvement and participation of the people. Now, fast forward to ASEAN today. How does the 51-year-old organization look with regard to its relationship with civil society? Well, uh, through the years, a number of promising developments showed the increased commitment of ASEAN member states on the importance of bringing in the voice and the view of civil society in the conduct of business in ASEAN. I can perhaps mention here among others, the ASEAN Institute for Strategic and International Studies, ASEAN ISIS, ASEAN People's Forum, and ASEAN Civil Society Conference, where the latter two are formal forums for civil society engagement with ASEAN, usually convened prior to uh, formalities of the ASEAN Summit. Now, while there have been many progresses made on civil society engagement and inclusivity in ASEAN, nevertheless, it comes with a note that the majority of engagement is within the economic and socio-cultural pillar. Therefore, I do believe, uh, and I do sense that the presentation by our two distinguished and experienced panelists are very interesting and an eye-opening to better comprehend the state of engagement and cooperation between uh, member states and civil society in the context of peace processes in ASEAN. Now, allow me to refer to a study uh, made by the German foundation, uh, Friedrich Ebers Stiftung done in 2011 on the landscape of engagement and cooperation between governments of ASEAN member states and civil society in peace process, says and, and others. The, the study out that throughout the ASEAN member states, the state continued to be the most crucial player in setting the conditions for civil society. The state uh, has the power through its institutional capacities to determine the character and the association with them. Uh, of CSO range of agriculture, climate, environmental and sustainable development to human rights and human governance issue, economic issues. Another study by uh, 
the roles that civil society played also varied in the manner in which they participated in peace building across King Dallas and the Philippines and Minnesota. And it showed the different roles of TSO uh, in, uh, in these processes, uh, ranging from in monitoring and interpreting. In light, in light of these uh, uh, diverse conditions such as ASEAN, I think uh, perhaps uh, there is no one size fits all norm regarding civil society engagement and collaboration uh, with the uh, state and the, uh, the government. And I think uh, here uh, comes uh, the ASEAN IPR where it could fill in the so-called uh, gap in bridging the roles, coordination, coherence for further engagement, inclusivity and collaboration between government and civil society in the political security pillar of ASEAN community building process. Uh, the study have shown, of course, that how significant, even crucial, are the roles of local uh, CS of the in, and NGOs are in recent and contemporary peace processes in the region. The ASEAN Institute for Peace and Reconciliation uh, can be seen as a track uh, 1.5 in nature. We are an institution that was established under the 2015 APSC blueprint. And within its work, operation, and reaching its objective, the Institute is given the flexibility to engage, cooperate, and collaborate with as many like-minded institutions and civil society organizations. The ASEAN IPR is assigned to be one of the implementers of 10 action line in the APC blueprint. Therefore, it is through this endeavor that the ASEAN IPR could bridge the gap in fulfilling uh, even more inclusivity for the civil society in the context of peace building, conflict management, conflict resolution, and uh, reconciliation. Uh, I like to uh, conclude by, by uh, saying uh, uh, that uh, and taking the uh, presentation by Min Zhao of the challenges being faced by uh, CSO, uh, civil society, that uh, relates to funding uh, where uh, there, are, there is more and more competition of allocation of funding, uh, human resources, even though now they have a real, uh, uh, quite a high quality of expertise, but uh, uh, certainly uh, the movement of uh, human resources to other uh, uh, work uh, uh, position is also very, uh, 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 very uh, present. And therefore, uh, the, uh, the constant availability of human resources is, is very key for CSOs. And he referred, Mizao referred also on governance, uh, transparency and accountability uh, by the CSOs. So I do believe also that do, with the, within the activities of the ASEAN IPR, there could be some kind of capacity building for uh, CSOs uh, in ASEAN. Secondly, uh, uh, within its activities where uh, uh, CSO, civil society are invited and government are invited, there can be uh, something to enhance networking and to learn from each other experiences and practices. And uh, I do believe sitting together in many of the activities of the ASEAN IPR uh, between uh, people from the civil society and government officials, uh, it would uh, help increase trust. Uh, Min Zhao referred to trust deficit. So we could increase trust and comfort comfortability uh, between CS, civil society and government officials. And, uh, and lastly, it's also important that uh, we, through the ASEAN IPR, could generate studies and identify those uh, 
CSOs in the region, in the ASEAN region, that are uh, working uh, for uh, uh, in the field of conflict resolution, peace processes, and reconciliation. Uh, and thereby, we can very zoom in on those uh, local ASEAN uh, civil society uh, and uh, work with them and try to increase the uh, collaboration between government and CSO. Perhaps I stop there, Emma, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Ambassador, not only for your comments, but also your ongoing leadership. And we look forward to seeing you, how you carry forward peace and conflict transformation as a theme into your future. Uh, this is not goodbye. We have another webinar coming up in a few weeks. That was a free advertising moment. Now, there are questions coming in on YouTube channels, questions and answers and chats. So, Ging and Minzo U, please. Cameras on, I'm going to try and throw a few of them to you um, and give you a few moments each to have a chance to respond. So I see um, Susan Rizal from Nepal has been highly active asking questions around women's participation in Philippines peace processes, but equally about um, CSOs um, bringing the talks agenda to the Myanmar process. And she's curious about this because of her own context of Nepal. I also have Gus McClatt, who is, as ever, the leading CSO peace builder in our region, pummeling us with fantastic questions. Um, I'm going to take two of them. I believe the questions about the current peace process in the Philippines, he and Ging can have a private conversation about later. But he has been asking, particularly for Min So U, about um, the energy and ongoing sustainability of CSO's participation in the Myanmar process. Um, and how they've managed to, how, how we can re-energize them in, in the sense of uh, seeing results. Um, I also have, excuse me for a minute, let me just recap. Gus has also asked about impartiality and neutrality. Um, he said, you said CSOs need to be impartial. Do you mean neutral or do you mean independent, non-partisan? And he would like some more collaboration. Uh, um, expansion on that. So maybe I'll leave those two themes, women, CSOs, keeping energy, continuing to show up. How do we deal with disappointment in peace processes, neutrality and impartiality? Ging, you look alert and ready to go. Shall I go to you first and then to Minzo? I, I'll, um, I'll take up the question on, on, on women's, women's participation in the peace process. I think the question was how strong was it in the Philippines? And I, I think we, we will need to say that women's participation in the peace process was far ahead in civil society before um, it was able to permeate government. And in civil society, it was, uh, as I had said, when the peace, um, when, the, when the, fir the first coalition for peace um, got together, um, this was not such a conscious um, question or concern, but as it happened through time, it began to be noticed that it was women. It was it was the women that were always there that that pursued um, the peace. It wasn't just seasonal. While the men would usually come when there was a crisis, uh, when the situation was bad, uh, the women were always there, and, and the men noticed it. And, and they said, hey, we have to start making sure we also attend all the meetings because the women are always are always there. And they, in fact, the peace movement became led, began, began to be led by, um, by women. It took a while, as I said, for government um, to open up to that. It, uh, uh, government's um, own view on the peace process, I, I would have to say, would, was initially um, more closer to, the, to a military solution. Um, the office that I sat in, uh, the Office of the Presidential Advisor on the Peace Process, I was the first woman to be appointed in, to, in 2000. Before that, it was uh, always led by men and men who were uh, trained in the military. And with that comes a particular way of looking things, at things a particular way of, um, of um, uh, even who, who are the people that, that you bring into the process. Um, but, but 
but there were things are changing. There were discourses. There were discourses also because of the need to transform the military, the questions of coming from a dictatorship, what should the military look like? There began to be serious discussions even within the security sector of um, security sector reform and the and and the, the discourse on is it the security of the state or human security. And this was also taken on by some of them. Um, the officials in the de defense establishment. So there was that going on. And I think what the, what the first thing that happened was that um, the peace process embraced the, the peace talks, I mean, embraced a broader range of questions and concerns. Uh, so that in the beginning, the likelihood that men would sit on the table because the questions were more hard security and military when you broaden the question into a broader understanding of peace, you had a broader range of subjects you be, and others could come in and the civilianization of the process started. So that by, well, by 2000, in fact, what happened was I was appointed um, to the office, a woman who had no military training. And uh, and by, 20, uh, by 2010, uh, the second time I came back, then the, 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 we, were, we were clearer. The women who came into the peace process were clearer about our, our agenda, were clearer about our strategies. And when women become come appointed into a, a position, what I say is that, that is so important because women know other women. Women know who, which women are working in what areas. Women know, women grew up with other women. They know what women are capable of. They begin to bring in women into the peace process. So yes, uh, by the last stage, by the time of 2014, when the Comprehensive Agreement on the Bangsamoro was signed, I was the um, minister on the peace process by then. The chief, the chief negotiator, the one um, was Miriam Coronel Ferrer, a woman, the first woman to sign a major peace agreement on behalf of a combat party. Um, that, and then there were five signatories, women signatories to that peace process on, the, on, on government side. The head of the panel was a young woman. The head of the legal panel of government was a young woman aged under 30, a moral woman, in fact. Uh, and three of the four technical working groups that worked on the agenda, wealth sharing. Uh, wealth sharing was led by a woman. Um, power sharing, that was led by a man, but a mother, uh, modalities of transition was led by a woman. And even um, the uh, normalization process, uh, which has a lot of security, which, which, is, which is, deals a lot with hard, so-called hard security questions. Uh, was was led by a woman and the and on our side government uh, the the joint committee on normalization was led by a woman so uh, yes by that by that time and it was very important um, I, I I like to say that when when the comprehensive agreement on the Bank Samora was signed it was for me so important that the world well Filipinos and our young people especially to see that it was a woman that was signing it. Where previously in all our earlier peace agreements, you had women passing the paper and all men on the principal table. But this time around, very taking very crucial leadership uh, were women. And some will say that some will say that's why finally 17 years of protracted negotiations um, came to a conclusion. Uh, because they, the women did not give up and they had both, both the policy and the housekeeping, the, the peace process housekeeping, because every process like this needs the boring work, also needs to get done. And women get them done both ways, both, both get them done. And as I said, can talk to women from all sides of the conflict. Speaking of getting it done, I've got questions backed up here today, so I'm going to keep Keep moving us forward. Thank you, King. What I can see here is that we have a ton of webinar topics emerging from this one, um, and definitely one about the need for women's leadership in peace processes, precisely for the reasons King said. 
Menzo, I'm going to cross to you precisely because you've stirred up a hornet's nest around CSOs. On top of uh, the questions you've already been asked, I see the Cambodian ambassador ASEAN is asking about CSO impartiality in peace building, particularly those that involve with conflicting and distrustful parties. And how do you ensure that CSOs um, do not carry the agenda of the foreign funding nations? Um, so a lot of a whole new seminar actually <laughs> out of that one and I'm giving you four and a half minutes. Good luck. Uh, first of all, uh, this uh, the word we usually use called insider impartial because in the peace process, it is very difficult to be 100% neutral. So while we were working at the Myanmar Peace Center, which is the semi-government body, we are not neutral because we are part of the semi-government body. But the way we work is impartial. Because in the peace process, your job is to help all the parties reach a acceptable solution. That's a job. So if you only advocate for the parties of your own interests, you will never reach that acceptable solution. So for that reason, you always have to consider the interests of the other parties. That means impartiality. So when I was a lead technical advisor uh, to the nationwide ceasefire agreement negotiations, uh, I always remind the government's chief negotiator, think about the interests of the armed groups, what, what they want. So the solution to the agreement is not your own interest. If you're thinking about your own interest, you will never reach that goal. So if you want to reach a, a solution, think about the other interests as well and find a common ground. So that way, is, uh, that is the difference between uh, what is impartial and what is neutral. And there's another issue about the CSOs. For example, like if a CSO is participating in a ceasefire violations, a ceasefire monitoring of the violations. When sees the observer sees a violation by a party close to the observer, they still have to report it. They still have to make it as a violation. So the CSO to be impartial is to make sure that agreement is implemented in a way that agree by both sides, both parties. So whoever violate the agreement, the CSO must stand up and point it out that that was a violation. So that is what I mean by impartial. So that CSO may be close to the armed groups, may be close to the government, may be close to particular ethnic groups, but <clears throat> for that reason, it may not be 100% neutral. However, they can be impartial by adhering to the agreements, the implementation of the agreement, what stipulate in the agreements uh, by the both sides uh, in the negotiations. So that's my uh, touch on impartiality versus uh, neutrality. Maybe a related question to the other half um, of the question about sustaining CSO energy. So I see Hani Samantha has been asking, um, how do we synchronize the economic and security agendas? Um, but there was a more specific question about, um, in, in Myanmar in particular, about the regional integration of economics. So I can see there's a whole thread here around economy and the peace process. But I'm guessing some of these questions are trying to ask about um, the delivery of the peace process in terms of um, economic development for those conflict affected communities. I hope I haven't just butchered the question, but um, I, maybe you want to make some comment about that. I think it connects to the frustration of CSOs not seeing progress in the peace process. Pienso, so let me hand to yeah, you. Uh, the, the frustration, the major cause of the frustration is not seeing the result especially for the CSO, when they see the result for their time, energy, all the investment, they find it fruitful. But when they don't see the result, people get discouraged, 
uh, people think like, oh, you know, we may be doing something uh, wrong and people are frustrated. So <clears throat> for the government, if the government wants to promote the very active participation of the CSO, the government shows some results in the peace process. That's the number one. And number two <clears throat> is there has to be activity. They can do it together. So in the peace process, especially when there was agreement between the government and armed groups, implementation of the agreements in this process, if the government and the armed, uh, uh, ethnic armed groups, if they bring the CSOs a part of the implementation, then uh, their input could be quite uh, uh, effective and uh, productive as well. Thank you. I feel acutely aware today that, of course, a number of the stakeholders to conflict, um, who are in particular the armed, often armed organisations or political parties that, that create some kind of conflict because of their grievances are not really in this conversation. Um, we are really interacting between government and CSO types of perspective. Um, I do see there's a question uh, from my friend Ujo Mian in Myanmar who is asking, can a terrorist organization become an armed or an ethnic armed organization? I think it's quite a Myanmar specific uh, question. Um, but I think in general, it raises the question about, um, I see there are other security questions coming in about when do we consider a stakeholder to a conflict a spoiler? When do we consider them a terrorist? And when do we consider them an equal party at the table? And I want to give that one to Ging um, as our last sort of actual segue into our next webinar, which is going to be more on security and terrorism and so on and so forth. So Ging, can you say a little bit about armed mm -hmm. actors? Yes. Um of course, of course that was that was that was always a question of how how do you define um how do you define terrorism? And uh, I think that the first was to come across uh, all parties and all stakeholders is that disavowal of, of terrorism, extremism, um, uh, which is basically uh, an understanding of the need to respect international humanitarian law. Because while there are, there are armed conflicts, um, even in war, there are codes of conduct. Even in war, there are laws about the protection of civilians. Even in war, there are rules about combatants out of combat. So actions that go outside of that, actions that uh, that in fact harm people who are sometimes not even, you know, uh, innocent bystanders and uh, in, in that way already um, sets, uh, already sets the alarm bells. And the, the the big discourse of um, um, even uh, is it a terrorist group or is it a group that has a legitimate objective but is using terrorist uh, maybe using some terrorist tactics? Then that has to be interrogated as well. And uh, I think it's a very important discussion um, even among civil society. And in the Philippines, what did happen was that that was asked of the of the of the of the uh, of the party across the table about its position, about its position in that, about making a complete disavowal of that. And if things happened within the coming from the ranks of that group to make them accountable for that, they couldn't. They can't just say, "We are here on the table," and if one of our um, one of our combatants does something and and say that you know but that was not sanctioned by, by us that was not ordered by us still and all once you sit on the table then you take on the responsibility of of of, of putting discipline you begin to say but that's that's not good enough that's not good enough what are you going to do about it same thing as they should ask government because sometimes some of those acts come from government that question should also be asked of government what is government going to do about the ones in its ranks that don't follow that don't follow the rules that that bio, that uh, that violate uh, humanitarian law? What 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 are sanctions against soldiers as well? 
that 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 is an ongoing thing i think it is important in a peace process that people begin to see the public begins to see that the talks are in fact helping to put such actions um away uh what was uh, in our other peace process uh, uh with the with the communist forces became a, a very bro problematic issue was when um peace talks would be announced about agreements being made there and then a big explosion would happen and people begin to lose begin to question question is there a connection between the peace talks is this really just a game when on the ground on the ground um anything goes uh i think both parties and i always say both parties have to be have to keep true to that that while there may be and it has so happened sometimes the closer you get to the peace process that there will be something that will happen to question where this is really going it takes um it makes both parties accountable to make sure that they're telling the people but this is what we're going to do so that that doesn't happen again thank you gang i think our time is coming to a close i want to just to take a moment to acknowledge a few more people in the room of course um, the executive director of the AHA Center, Adelina Kamal, is with us. Um, a number of the ASEAN ambassadors, um, various ambassadors to ASEAN are with us. Um, the UK and Korean embassies are with us. So thank you so much for all of your active participation and joining us online. I think you'll note that part of our discussion today has not been to talk about what's happening in this current moment in ASEAN and, and with the COVID pandemic, but also a number of other very serious um, violent conflicts going on in our region and a need, hungry, uh, urgent need um, for us to try and continue to keep alive peace processes. I think some a major takeaway from the conversation today is we've been told since the early 80s that multi-track diplomacy is the way that we get things done and that we fly in big man mediators from other places in order to crack heads together and sign peace agreements. But everything that Dr. Minso U and, and Secretary Dallas, well, former Secretary Dallas has shared with us um, has been really saying that actually we all need to work together, that we all have roles to play. There are back channeling roles, there's preparing groups, there's helping groups to transition from terror to becoming viable political peace partners at a table. There's keeping the pressure, there's advocacy, there's expertise, there's ceasefire monitoring. There's so much for all of us to be doing, whether we're from CSOs, whether we're parties to the conflict, whether we're in politics, men and women, young people. Um, and of course, in ASEAN, I think we have extraordinary examples of that to share. So I'd like to thank so much our speakers and of course our discussant um, kudos for your leadership in this region and for everything that you've done to help bring about peace. May you have more energy to continue. May you help to continue to inspire each of us as we continue. Thanks to our partner IPA today for all of the tech team who's behind the scenes here, pulling their hair out and trying to keep this smooth. Let me draw this to a close before we have a techie disaster beyond now. Uh, thank you so much. September 11 is a date that none of us will ever forget. So September 11, we're going to have another webinar in the same vein, the impact of COVID-19 on the spread of, let me get the, the spread of radicalization and violent extremism in ASEAN. And considering this is 19 years after the September 11 attack. So please join us. We'll be advertising on the same channels um, thank you so much for your patience. Peace be with all of you and power and strength to everyone who works for peace. Thank you so much.